today we're going to launch into the first part of getting ready for the last days, spotting and avoiding manipulation. Now, manipulation is a subject as, which we will see that is very deep and complicated. Manipulation is an activity that is closely related to other activities that we will focus upon in this first part of the series. All of us are guilty of manipulation. Uh, we, we will see later that we're born with the innate ability and, uh, and we take advantage of opportunity to manipulate others. Even our children, we can see it in our kids. Kids learn very early on how to manipulate and even try to manipulate us and even your grandkids can manipulate you because it's something that we're born with. We're born with it inside of us. Some of us are better at it than others, as we will see. All, as if, all of us have used it on the past. In fact, parents, you, you have to confess that probably you have used manipulation, as we will describe it later on in the definition of it. You've used it, believe me, on your children. So manipulation is something which we have all been a part of. Persuasiveness um, is something that is not evil, but persuasiveness can drift into manipulation. People who are very persuasive can easily slide into the practice of manipulation. And we will see that manipulation is a very serious subject in the eyes of God. It's something that is actually condemned by God. And as we will see, it's, it's related. It has some, some very, very um, evil relations. It has a big family, manipulation does, and uh, it's not a good family. But the end result of manipulation that is condemned by God is the manipulation that is used for selfish ends, to get your own way. Now, why are we talking about manipulation in a message or in a series, the beginning of the series, getting ready for the last days? Well, first of all, I believe that we are in the last days. Anybody that has any sense at all as to what's going on in the world around them in the effort that you make to, to wade through the news that you receive to, to see if you can catch some kernel of truth, certainly recognizes that we are right in the middle of those days that were prophesied in many of the books of the Bible. And we don't have to strain, we don't have to, to try to work to find those verses or the context, take it out of context, to apply it to what's happening today. It is alarmingly clear that you and I are in the last days and things are rapidly accelerating. And so in these last days, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, one of the scriptures that refers to the period of time which we are living in, it says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. It goes on to say, evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And so as we embark on this series of messages, I consider it the utmost of my responsibility by the Lord Jesus Christ to prepare all of us to be able to stand and to live in victory in these last days. That's part of our responsibility. We're seeing a separation even uh, in the churches as to their intention and their goals. Some are putting their hands around their eyes and um, almost like the three monkeys, see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil. They're, they're see no evil and hear no evil, but the, the evil that they're trying to block out is actually should be, the evil should not be partaken in, but the, the evil should be pointed out for the protection of those who are following Christ. Now, I know that sometimes as I embark on these series that it seems as if we're talking about something that's very negative, but I must tell you that I believe that, I, that we're in a period of great activity, not just of the uprising and escalation of evil, but I believe we're seeing an increase in the intensity and the activity of the Spirit of God. I am sensing and picking up that there is indeed a remnant and a growing remnant of individuals that alerted by God to what is going on are begin, beginning to awaken and beginning to find their place as soldiers of Christ. Now today we're going to use a scripture that you may not have heard about. 
Perhaps you've read of it, but it is a scripture that is going to be uh, towards the, taken towards the end of one of David's sons, David's son Absalom. Absalom was a uh, difficult young man. He has a history, as you read 2 Samuel, and uh, beginning about the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, you'll begin to read of the story of David's son, Absalom. Very strong-willed, very hard-headed young man, very beautiful young man. The Bible's very clear. It says that there was not one mark of imperfection in him, but that his beauty was incredible. He was an incredibly handsome young man in every way, evidently. In fact, even the hair of his head was so beautiful and thick that when he chose to cut it, it weighed five pounds, just the hair that he cut off. I don't even want to talk about that. It just makes me incredibly jealous. And if I'm not careful, I'll, I'll, I'll slip into bitterness. And so I have to move on away from that, that hair thing. But, but Absalom had a problem. And that problem is that there was a strong spirit of manipulation that moved in him. Not only manipulation, but as we will see, intimidation and deception, these are all part of the family of manipulation. And he has already been driven from the kingdom once because of murdering Amnon. And David then has allowed him to come back at the request of Joab, David's mighty man and his right hand bodyguard. Joab was a mighty warrior and, and Joab recognized that David truly wanted Absalom, but David, because of his office, had banished Absalom. Absalom was allowed to come back, but lived for two years in the kingdom, but David would never allow Absalom to come into his presence. And finally, finally, Absalom sent for Joab and they were able to converse and Absalom said, look, I've had enough of this. It's not, it's really no good for me to be here if I don't ever get to see the king, my father. So either execute me, let's get it over with, or go to, go to my father and see if he'll allow me. And so Absalom then did appear before King David and David, of course, in fatherly love, kissed him and there was a reuniting. However, the spirit of manipulation and the desire for power and prestige and to have his own way was still very strong in Absalom. And so we find, we pick this story up in verses, um, in 2 Samuel, and we're going to read verses 15, or verses, excuse me, chapter 15, and beginning with verse one. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me and I would see that he gets justice. And whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice and so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This is a perfect picture, illustration of a form of manipulation. You and I, as today, are living in a very incredibly deceptive time period. And we are living in a time in which manipulation and the course of manipulation and the efforts and strength of manipulation is increasing. Therefore, it is imperative that you and I be able to spot 
and avoid manipulation. Not only deception, but manipulation. Now, my intention in the script, in this, in the series is not to cause, you know, some people, I've heard some people say, I have discernment when really they were just suspicious of everyone. And we're not, we're not going to share all of this so that you live a, in a life of suspicion. Because the Bible, as we will see in another sermon, the Bible can give us discernment by His Spirit of truth. So the goal is not just to make you suspicious of everyone, but it is actually to lead us to a place where we can recognize it and discern it. So let's talk about what is manipulation. Manipulation, as I said to you earlier, comes from a bad family. Manipulation is related to some other activities that are not for the good of mankind and not for your good and my good. Manipulation is different from deception, but often uses deception. So the message today is not on deception, but deception will be a part of today's message. Deception is, is defined as the act of misleading or causing someone to accept as true and valid what is false and invalid. We are, we are walking through a time of dramatic deception. In fact, we need to know how to, re how to recognize it because we are all vulnerable to deception. Every one of us are vulnerable to deception. If you think that you are impossible to, see, to deceive because of your intelligence or your experience or your pedigree or your church membership, etc., guess what? You're already deceived because deception can work on all of us. And we've come through and are even in the midst of an intense period of, and purposeful period of worldwide misinformation and deception. We saw that released, vomited upon this world in an unprecedented level during, the, during this time of COVID-19. We were daily inundated with a myriad of misleading information from every direction every area of life. And so as a result, we were left punch drunk. And if not careful, we can move into a, a level of mistrust of everyone and everything we hear that will result in a potential loss of critical information that we need and for our own good. We just simply don't know who to believe or what to believe or what to consider as a source of truth. And we're going to be speaking about that during the course of these series. The Bible tells us that there is such a thing as deception and that in the last days, as I read to you earlier, deception will increase. It will be a time period when not only does the Bible say in Daniel that knowledge will increase exponentially. The book of Daniel tells us that the speed at which men will travel will increase exponentially. Remember that in Daniel's time, the horse was the fastest vehicle, the fastest mode of transportation that any man could use. But Daniel, through the Spirit of God, looked into the future and saw that there was coming a time period when man would be able to travel at, at a tremendous speed. But also, he said, there will be a tremendous increase of information. They tell us now that information is doubling just every few minutes. It is incredible that knowledge that is doubling and now AI has, has actually even increased the speed of that and that we are in a very dangerous time period when it is incredible to believe that there is a possibility of artificial intelligence displacing and actually exceeding the intelligence of humanity. And unless controlled, could possibly usurp the authority of humanity and begin to control human beings. Daniel saw this. And in the increase of knowledge, the Bible tells us because of that and because of the hardness of men's hearts and the increase of evil, deception will be everywhere. And so you and I must be wary. You and I must be on guard, not afraid, not living in fear, not constantly suspicious, but on guard. And the Bible tells us that even wickedness and sin has a deceptive quality to it. There's something that fools us 
There's something about sin that fools us when we partake of it. And it begins to numb our conscience. It begins to cause us to lose grip on reality. And it is possible for us to drift to such a point that the Bible tells us in the first chapter of Romans that we can come to a place where God will give us over to a reprobate mind, to believe those things that are not convenient and not even true. The deceptiveness of sin, it carries its built in. It's built into sin. The Bible, of course, tells us that Satan is a deceiver. He's the ultimate deceiver. Satan, the devil, is the one who really is the, the perfection of deception. And the last name that God calls Satan is the deceiver. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 3, he threw him into the abyss, an angel. There is coming a day when you and I are going to witness the binding and the judgment of Satan. I tell you, I'm looking forward to that. There's coming a day when a great angel, the Bible says, at the command of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take some type of chain, I believe that's symbolic for power, and, and, and is going to chain Satan and throw him, it says, and locked and threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to listen, to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. To keep him from deceiving the nations anymore. Now listen, when Satan comes to us, he comes even sometimes as an angel of light. He comes in such a manner and so deceptive and he will assure us that we are doing our own thing. I read an awesome quotation by Dr. Dennis Kinlaw, former president of Asbury University, in regards to the methods that Satan uses to deceive humanity. Here's what he said. He said, Satan disguises submission to himself under the ruse of personal autonomy. The devil never asked us to become his servants. He did not say to Eve, I want to be your master. The shift in commitment is never from Christ to evil. It is always from Christ to self. And instead of his will, self-interest now rules and what I want reigns. Very close, very close, an incredible statement that describes the intention, the goal, and the purpose also not only of deception, but manipulation. Now let's talk just for a moment about intimidation because manipulation also has another cousin in the family and it's called intimidation, not just deception, but intimidation. Intimidation is very closely related to manipulation. We've all met people who are deceptive. We've all met governments who are deceptive entities who are deceptive. We've all met individuals who are manipulators. And as we will see, even governments can be, can be and are guilty of manipulation. And we've all met individuals who manipulate. And we're going to be talking about some of the characteristics and how this happens and what it looks like. But intimidation is also a cousin that we have all met in individuals. It's closely related. Intimidation is the action of frightening or threatening someone, usually in order to persuade them to do something you want them to do. That's intimidation. Now, manipulation is related to intimidation, but intimidation is more upfront and in your face. The nature of intimidation is it doesn't hide itself like manipulation. Manipulation skillfully, skillfully, utilizes giftings to manipulate. But intimidation merely uses a club. And intimidation is an individual or a person, whether through the force of their personality or their position or, or because of the authority they may hold in your life or just some point of influence, they literally bully you into doing what they want you to do. And they, they do that through threats. They do that sometimes through physical threats, but most often as adults, they do this with other types of threats. If you don't do this, I'm going to do this. 
or you've seen them work on other individuals. And through their pattern of intimidation, you've seen what has happened to other individuals who have stood up to them, so to speak. And that is called intimidation. Those who have God in his right place and man in his right place will not be intimidated. I say that again, those people who have God in his rightful place and man in his rightful place in their life, if you have God in the place he should be in your life and man in the place he should be in your life, then you will not be intimidated. Leonard Ravenhill, a wonderful holiness preacher said, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. And so intimidation is one of the ugly cousins of manipulation, deception, intimidation. But let's get to manipulation before we close here. What does manipulation mean? What does it look like? Manipulation is to manage or utilize skillfully. It is the skillful handling, controlling, or using of something or someone. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. If <clears throat> when a sculptor, a skilled sculptor, takes a piece of clay and begins to work it. They are manipulating that clay skillfully into the image they desire. That is a beautiful picture uh, and description of manipulation. Now, when a gifted politician works a crowd, that's a good illustration of manipulation. And so we recognize that it's skillful. Whoever manipulates is skillful. They are utilizing often deception, sometimes intimidation. This can all shift back and forth. But the purpose of manipulation is to cause someone eventually or some group eventually or something to do what the manipulator wants them to do. It's always for selfish reasons. That's why we used Absalom. Absalom is a perfect picture of a, of a style of manipulation. You notice how he would ask and show concern for the people coming to see the king. He stood in between the king and the people. Absalom, the son of the king, stood in between the king and the people. His desire was to shift their allegiance to him, and he did it by serving them. It all seemed so wonderful. People left there saying, isn't Absalom just a wonderful young man? I mean, I, he, he is willing to represent me. And it goes on to say that when they went to bow or kiss him, he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't allow them to do that. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Can't you hear him? Can't you see him? Oh, no, no, don't do that. I'm just happy to be able to serve you. I'm just happy to be able to help you. All the while, skillfully utilizing manipulation on a whole nation of people. That's why the Bible says he stood, he, he stole the hearts of the people away from David at the very gate. He stood at the gate. That is a picture of manipulation. Manip powerful entities, even governments, can and do use manipulation. We've seen this increasing in unprecedented manner in recent years. The news media, which was once trusted, we thought we could trust the news media. Huntley and Brinkley, some of these people, Walter Cronkite, <clears throat> they reported the news. They did not use the news to manipulate and guide and direct and create an agenda and to fulfill an agenda. But we've seen the news media that we saw as a source in the United States of accuracy has become a biased source of propaganda with agendas. And that is manipulation. You see it daily on the television. You see it on your phones. You see it on your computers. This thing called manipulation. And this is something that will increase, the Bible says. Even science now is being used as a tool for deception and manipulation. Science has been 
used and now being used for propaganda-filled agendas. And science has now even turned its attention on our children to fulfill a demonic agenda by telling them that they can't really be sure of their gender and that they can change their gender. And if they change their gender, agen gender they will truly be happy. Utilizing science as a manipula manipulative tool. Another word what's going on for our kids, by the way, is indoctrination. Indoctrination. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, science, true science, does not advocate nor does it confirm the potential or possibility of bending your gender or changing it. It just isn't scientifically accurate. But again, never have we lived in a day when we have seen that science is doing it. We've been told by powerful worldwide scientific coalition of experts, such as Al Gore, that we are destroying our earth by the release of CO2 and the evidence is irrefutable. We are in dire straits. Our, our world is going to pass away if we don't change course. All of this is utilizing quote unquote science to manipulate the masses and to literally change the course of nations and the reliance upon certain sources of fuel for their own people. It's all manipulation. It's all deception. And just recently, we are hearing more and more scientists, valid scientists, experts truly in the field that have begun to raise their voice. And in raising their voice, they tell us they've been trying to raise their voice for years, but they were muzzled and they were silenced and they were canceled. Ladies and gentlemen, this all points to a gigantic, massive effort to deceive and to manipulate you, nations, as a people. And this will increase because there will be a day when the Antichrist, that individual who we do not know who it is down through the years, everybody's the Antichrist. I've heard this person and that person and I've heard books. There have been books written on this person, the Antichrist. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's another clue for you. Don't be deceived. Don't, don't allow people who've written books out of good intention to take your money. But when the Antichrist, the man of sin, does appear, he will be someone that will be so skilled in manipulation. Hitler was a very persuasive personality. And as you will see here later on, persuasiveness is not manipulation, but persuasive people are very much, very much tempted to manipulate. It's so easy to slide into manipulation. When you are persuasive, when you are intelligent, it's so easy to slide into manipulation. Many manipulators are very intelligent people. You have to be smart to be able to cover your tracks. You have to be smart to be able, they have to be smart to be able to study you until they find a chink in your armor and then they begin to appeal to you and they begin to manipulate you. Manipulation. It, but it's not limited to powerful entities or governments. It's used most often by individuals. All of us are guilty of it. We have relatives that when we go to a family gathering, we kind of get a kick because one of the wives of the husband, if we get into a decision-making process or we're talking about what we'd like to do or not like to do, or maybe even what we'd like to eat or not eat, the wife will always say to the husband, call him by name and say, you wouldn't want to do that, would you? You, you wouldn't want to fly, would you? Notice that it's a question, but it's one that's steering. And I tell you, most often the husband, and if you're not careful, husbands or wives, you can fall into this too, to avoid any type of conflict. No, I guess I wouldn't want to do that. That, ladies and gentlemen, is, is called a spirit of control. That's called manipulation. And we're, we've all been guilty of it. And so we have to be careful. There's a difference between charisma, wins winsomeness, and manipulation. But again, charismatic people 
can easily slip into manipulation. There's a difference in authority and manipulation. However, people in power, people with authority can slip easily into manipulation, the manipulation of those around them. As we said, intelligent people can manipulate, but it's born in us. Now, manipulative individuals can utilize a variety of behaviors to accomplish its goal and their goal. Anger, sometimes manipulative people will feign anger to bring about fear. That's also used in intimidation. And the person immediately begins to back down. Or victimhood, another favorite trick of a manipulator is to often play the victim, making it seem as if they've been wronged by you or others so that you give them sympathy and yield to what they want when essentially they haven't been wrong. It's very quick of a manipulator to put out the bottom lip and begin to pout. And in an effort, we've seen our kids do that, in an effort to try to turn you back to what they want you to do. Essentially trying to get you to feel sorry for them so that they can get their way. But the most used tool of manipulative people is compliments and favors. To control a person or group through compliments, through favors, and they begin to, we see that happening with, with political parties. We'll give you this if you'll give us your vote. We'll do this for you. That's all manipulation. That's all control. And individuals will do that. They'll study you. They'll study people. I've watched them. Even people in churches, even godly people in churches can fall prey to manipulation by other people, other Christians in church. And I've watched it. I've watched individuals, especially young believers, who are, who are very sensitive and who are very open to compliments and desire for attention and desire for love. And a manipulator will come into that area, immediately spot that weakness and recognize this is someone that can be used for my own good. I can bring them alongside of me as long as I give them some attention as long as I do this. And through that, control that person. Well, I'm going to have to close for today. I'm only a portion part way through. But let me just say this to you. Manipulative Christians sometimes even use God's name or scriptures to get their way and to do what they want to do. Sometimes they'll say things like, God showed me God showed me this about you or about us. Or they may even say, thus say as the Lord. And in reality, it's manipulation. And they sometimes use scripture out of context to manipulate a person or even whole groups of people. I've seen it happen. I've been in services where it happens. One time my wife and I were attending a very, very large church. And in a service, it happened to be the 44th birthday of the pastor. And an individual came up to the microphone at the conclusion of that service and said that God had showed them, God had showed them, that everyone who gave a $44 check in honor of blessing their pastor would receive a wonderful blessing from God. And if you wanted more of a blessing, you could just add more zeros to the 4-4. Four, four. And that even more blessing would come your way. And, and the pressure was incredible as they talked about it. And they had people testify about how God had blessed them. And then they received the offering. And I watched people next to me. I watched a, a lady next to me who looked without being judgmental as if she didn't have a lot of this earth's funds. An older lady. And I watched her dig through her purse trying to find $44 to give to that shyster. I'll tell you what, that is a spirit of manipulation. And God does not take that lightly. God will tell you, and he's very clear in his word, how we are to give. And we don't need to use manipulative methods. I don't use that method here, as you well know. And God has blessed you, a wonderfully giving congregation. But God will take care of his own work if we'll just do 
what we're supposed to do. Well, I need to close. What's the spiritual significance of manipulation? Well, the, the spiritual significance of this both ways, and I'm forwarding a little bit in the message ahead of myself, but the Bible tells us that manipulation is very dangerous, not only because of the family it keeps, but because it is related to witchcraft. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it says the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy. But witchcraft is in there. Now, what is witchcraft? What's the definition of witchcraft? What's going on with those individuals who practice witchcraft? Witchcraft is counterfeit spiritual authority. Witchcraft is using a spirit other than the Holy Spirit to dominate, manipulate, or control others. Using a spirit other than the Holy Spirit to dominate, manipulate, or control others. That's what witchcraft is. And the Bible tells us manipulation is related to witchcraft. Manipulation is not using another spirit. Manipulation is using the skill of the flesh to control others. The ability and skill of the flesh to control others. Manipulation is dangerous. Believe me, we don't want to practice it. We don't want to be guilty of it. We all are. But if you are manipulating others for the purposes of your own self-will and self-centeredness and goals, and you fall into that habit, God will have to help you break that habit and break that practice because it's very difficult. A controlling person, very difficult for them to yield. In fact, they are deceived many times and blind to their own manipulative practices. So next week we'll, we'll take this up again. What is the end result of manipulation? And we're going to go on in the series of what makes us vulnerable to manipulation, what are the, as we've talked about the signs of manipulation, and how can we not only recognize it, but break it? How can we break manipulation in our lives? How can we break it if we are a manipulator? God wants us to be free. And what we need to recognize as we leave is that God, manipulation, in the sense that the scripture condemns, is not of God. God is not a manipulator. If anybody could manipulate, it would be the almighty God. But God leads and God directs and God guides and God invites. He does not violate your free will. Just as we don't violate your free will to come to church. You can come or not come. It's up to you. God says, come, take my yoke upon you. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. Over and over and again, God says, come, come to me. The door is open. And once we come to him, he doesn't drive us. He doesn't force us. He doesn't manipulate us. The Bible says he leads us and he directs us. He doesn't drive us. That's the devil. The devil drives you. God guides you. And God is an enemy of manipulation because it takes away your autonomy. It takes away your free will. It takes away your ability to choose. God wants us to choose him, not be forced to serve him. And God wants people who are free. The Bible says, if the son makes you free, you are truly free indeed. That's the goal of God, your freedom, your liberty. And that's what we want to leave on recognizing that in the midst of an age of deception and manipulation, I've got good news for you. God can give you discernment and God can bring you and bring us into a place where we are recognizing that he's leading and directing and guiding our life and we are truly free because we're free in Christ. That sounds pretty good to me. How about you? Well, thank you for coming. God bless you. Let's close in prayer, Father. We recognize that there are many people here who are hurting. There are people here who have made an effort to come and be here today to hear your word because they wanted to be near you. And yet they're going through things in their own life 
perhaps tragedies, perhaps such stressful times that they don't really know what they're going to do. As we leave this place, we lift them in prayer. We join in prayer with them. We encourage them to come to you. Truly, truly the source of help and of strength. Come unto me, all you who are working so hard, laboring under a weight, under a burden, feel like you're being crushed, feel like you're suffocating. Come to me, take my yoke, take me, my yoke with you. It is a double yoke. I will help you. I will help pull the load. I'll help you with all that you need. For my yoke, my burden is light and it's easy. I pray that that will happen in someone's life right now. They'll just let go of it and say, God, I can't do it on my own. Lead me, guide me, direct me. I'm joining up with you. Be my companion. And Lord, you have promised them victory, victory in the midst of a broken world. And we thank you for it. We claim it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.